distribution on the exam. Um, people, there weren't a lot of A's or A minuses, but in general, people did sort of a little better. There were a lot more B's of various flavors this time than last time around. Uh, there were also, unfortunately, a lot of people in the sad face category. Um, <laughs> So the, the average is just under 74. The median, which is really a little more useful, is 76. So the median means as many people got above 76 as got below 76. So the mean usually tends to be a little lower because of these kind of people uh, who bring things down. Um, so actually that one is a zero. But I don't record a zero because it's a little hard to tell whether a zero is just a forgotten score or a zero. So I gave this guy one point, getting the name right. Um, okay, so that's how things went. Let me let me clarify a couple of issues regarding the grading in this class because I think there is some confusion. Um, it's a little bit complicated to explain exactly how I do the averaging. It is a straightforward way, but every time I try to explain it to students, their eyes go funny and they don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, I take each of the individual scores, I put them on a standardized scale. Let me not tell you what my standardized scale is, because that's one of the things that confuses people, but I put them on a standard scale, and then I compute the weighted average which means that if you're talking about midterm, that counts towards 25% of the total. If you're talking about the final, that counts towards 35% of the total, and so on. And that gives you a number. And that number is your grade. It's not exactly your grade. It is the minimum possible grade that you can get. Um, because in some cases, so for example, if somebody really figures things out, so they get an F on the first midterm, and then things start to come together for them, and they start getting Bs, well then I don't want to give that student a low grade. So if there is significant improvement, I take it into account. That does not mean that your grade is the best, is, is, is the best of your average or your grade on the final. It should be. It should be. Okay, however, one thing, I will not give a grade of lower than C to anyone who earns a decent C on the final, or better. So even if you have solid zero going into the final, and you figured things out, and you earn a C, or better, on the final, I will give you at least a C in the class. If you were right on the line between C and C minus, that doesn't count. So if you just barely clear a C on the final by one point, too bad. But the line of C on the final means demonstrated mastery of the material. So if you demonstrate at least passable mastery of the material on the final, I will not give you a useless grade in this class. So, you need at least a C to go on to the next class or to have this count for your major or any of that sort of thing. Well, it depends on your major. So you need at least a C. So if you earn a, a, an honest C on the final, I'll give you a C in the last two years. It does not mean that if you earn an A on the final, I will give you an A in the class. I will look closely at your grades and make decisions. Okay? Um, yeah. Any other questions? So you get these, these midterms back, the grades, if you haven't already, you can check them on the web, you get them back in uh, presentation. And please look at your, your exam for any addition errors or grade errors or that sort of thing. The solutions are up there. Yeah, you have a question. Okay, well then that means that 
got misreported. This is part of why I report the grades, because mistakes happen. So if it says your first midterm was not there and you got an F, or if it says your first midterm grade was a 27, yet you have a piece of paper that says 105, this means somebody typed in the wrong number when they reported your score. So bring your midterm, your paper to me, or to your TA, and say, look, this says I didn't do it, but here it is. And the same thing if we added 10 plus 10 and came up with 10, please let us know. These things happen when you're adding up 350 papers at 3 in the morning. Then this is a little more problematic. So if you can't find your midterm, you do have a record that you took it because you signed your name. So it's a lot easier if you can't find your midterm because then we can say, oh, this missing grade, it was 175. But if you can't find it, we can't know what it is. So that means we have to do something else. So, you know, if, if your grade is not misreported, it's our fault. We'll do something reasonable. It's better to do what's right. Any other issues, questions about grading, junk like that? Okay, so let's let's go back to doing math. No. Um, so on Friday, what we were talking about was um, this idea that if we have a function, we can determine the power series for it by evaluating the derivatives. So as an example, we did the series for e to the x and near x equals 0. So if by, by looking at the derivative, so we determine that this is uh, an x is 0. So that e to the x, uh, if it has, the, well, the power series of e to the x that we worked out is the powers of x divided by n factorial. So we went through, the, I'll go through this again more, but we did this just sort of by hand to determine that this power series converges to this function. Um, and we also, at the end of the class, determined that the sine of x is uh, x plus x cubed over 3, oops, minus, plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial plus blah, 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 which is n equals 0. It's an alternating series, which it alternates every other time. But we only get the odd powers of x and the odd factorials. Now we can go through this same process to determine a series for the cosine, but we can also just determine a series for the cosine by taking the derivative. So if we want, given these two facts, we can go through from first principles and figure out that the series for the cosine should be, should be 1 minus uh, x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial, etc. But we can also just take the derivative of the sine, which gives us the cosine, and just take the derivative of each of these terms and see that this is 1, and then this 3 comes down, giving us x squared, and the 3 cancels with the 3 factorial, leaving us, I guess, 2 factorial is 2, that's okay. And then for the 5 term, the 5 comes down and gives us a 4 factorial, so that gives us x to the 4th, 4 factorial, x to the 6th, over 6 factorial, and so on. Or, want to drop that? shocking for the microphone to deal with. So, or if we look at this, we'll see that this gives us x to the 2n 
over 2n factorial minus 1 to the n. Again, we start as a. So the first term falls away and then we re -enters. So you can do this just by taking derivatives or you can do this just by starting from knowing nothing and seeing what happens. So let me encapsulate. So all of these things, these are called McLaurin. I think it's an E. Might be an I. I think it's an I. Uh, McLaurin series, named after the Scottish mathematician who figured them out. Um, or also they're called Taylor series. Taylor series is a more general thing, a more general version of McLaurin. McLaurin series came first, but Taylor series is more general. I'll talk about what Taylor series is in a minute. And let me just remind you the process but in general. So to figure out the Taylor series or the McLaurin series, so the McLaurin series is the Taylor series, but let me, let me come back to that in a minute. I don't need this. So let's say Taylor series. Okay, so, so the general process here, so just to codify the business that we went through last Friday, I have a function f And I know its values, and I know f of 0, f prime of 0, f double prime of 0, all the derivatives at 0. And then what I can do is I can determine that f of x is the same thing as first evaluate the function at 0. That's the first term of the series. Then, the next term of the series will be what I get when I evaluate the derivative at 0, and I multiply by an x. And then, the next term of the series will be what I get when I evaluate the second derivative at 0, but I have to divide by 2. Because if you remember this process we went through to, divide, to determine this, the way we determine this is we say we have some power series. What if x is 0? Then f of x equals f of 0, so that's good. And then we take the derivative to kill off the constant term and turn the derivative term into a constant term. We take the derivative here, and then we get f prime at 0 equals f prime at 0. But here when I take the second derivative, I get a second, I get a power of 2, so I have to divide by 2. And then when I take the third derivative, I have to divide by the 2 from before, but then also the 3. And when I take the fourth derivative, I'll have to divide by the 4, the 3, the 2. And I just keep going like that. So in general, this is the sum from 0 to infinity of the nth derivative of x evaluated by 0 divided by n factorial. This gives me the coefficients. This is a number. And then I multiply by x to the n. So this is the, the form for a McLaurin series. I just keep taking derivatives and plugging in. That gives me the coefficients. And the x's give me the variable. So this is only true, of course, if this series converges. So we still have to check the radius of convergence and that sort of thing. That's why we went through this business with the radius of convergence. We have to check when this makes sense. The formula gives us a way to understand the function. Essentially what it does is it lets us trade very detailed local information. We know what happens at zero. 
We know derivatives at zero. We know second derivatives. We know all the derivatives at zero. And knowing what happens at one point really well tells us what happens nearby. And we can go the other way. Knowing what happens nearby tells us all the derivative information at one point. So we can either trade knowing sort of high level information in an area for knowing very detailed information at one point. This is, if you think about it, not really new to you. But it kind of is. You haven't seen this, I mean, well, you may not, you probably haven't seen this before stated in terms of infinite series, but you actually did see this in first semester calculus a little bit. So in first semester calculus, one thing that you did a lot is that I had some function, and I said, well, this function is just about its value at some point plus um, the derivative times, I mean, usually you see this with an A here. But you've seen this before. This is the tangent approximation. This is just saying, if I know here's my function, not much of a function, but if I know the value at A, and I know the derivative at A, I know a line that approximates it. So this, that's an A, not a 9. This is the equation of this line, and this is the graph of the function. And we've done that. And, is there a question? No. And then all we're doing is we're saying, well, you know, we don't want a, a line here. Why don't we use a parabola? So if we use a parabola and we want to find the parabola that goes through here, then we would actually have a parabola that goes through there. And so on. In fact, let me use a little technology here. Notice that this process that I did here 
relying on derivatives at zero. We can also do it with derivatives at other points, for example, at any point where we can calculate the derivative. I'll come back to that, but that's actually what's called the Taylor series. Taylor series is more general. A Maclaurin series is a Taylor series with a equals zero. Usually we use Maclaurin series because it's just easy. Usually it's easy to compute the function and all its derivatives at zero, but sometimes you want it away from zero. Let me do one more example of Maclaurin series. Sorry for wasting who knows how much of the class, but let's do that. So let's say we want to go through this process for the log of 1 plus x. Okay? So the reason that I'm doing 1 plus x is because, of course, the log of 0 is not a nice number, it's minus infinity. But I want a series that will allow me to calculate the log of 1 plus x. So that's values of x near 0, so the values of the logs near 1. So again, we can just, and let's just do the Maclaurin series for this. We start with f of x, we know its derivatives, or we can calculate its derivatives, and we can calculate their values and we can come up with the series. A lot of times people, if they're doing this, organize this into a little chart. The chart is not necessary, but it helps you keep track. So I'm just going to make a little chart to help you keep track. So this is f. And if I want to evaluate what is f of 0, uh, well, f of 0 here is the log of 1, which is just 0. So actually, there isn't going to be a constant term here, because it's going to start with 0. So our constant term here is 0. Now I take the derivative. The derivative of the log of 1 plus x. Well, the derivative of the log of x is 1 over x. The derivative of the log of 1 plus x is 1 over 1 plus x. We use the chain rule, but the derivative of 1 is 1. The derivative of x is 1, so that's fine. And if I plug in this at, I guess it's not f of 0, let's say at 0. If I plug in 0 for x, I get 1 over 1. I mean 1 over 1 plus 1, which is a half. And so my, my, my coefficient term here will be Oh, it's at 0, right. Thank you. I was thinking I was doing it at 1. So it's 1 over 1, which is 1. So my coefficient here is 1. So what I have so far is that my series is 0 plus 1. Not very interesting series so far. 1 times x. So there's a 1 here. Maybe we can put, let's just put the term in here too. And then I take the derivative again. So the derivative of, in fact, let's write it this way. Because it's easier to keep track of the derivatives. So the derivative of 1 plus x to the minus 1 is minus 1 plus x to the minus 2. Which is, again, when I plug in 0, 1. So this is minus 1 to the minus 2, which is still just 1. So my coefficient here is 1. Uh, but here, since it's the x squared term, I have to divide by 2. Because it's 1 over n factorial here, n is 2. So that means that my next term and it's negative. My next term in the series is minus x squared over 2. And if I do it again for the third derivative, well, this is a minus, minus 2 times 1 plus x to the minus 3. When I plug in, this is still a 1, 
So this just gives me a 2. But again, it's going to be 2 over uh, 3 factorial, which is a third. And so my next term will be plus x cubed over 3. And then if I go to the next term, I take the derivative here, I get minus 2 times 3 times 1 plus x to the minus 4. When I plug in x equals 0, I just get a minus 6 here. But again, I have minus 6 over 4 factorial, which is just a quarter negative. So then I get minus 1 fourth x to the fourth. Yeah? Where did the 2 go? Where did the 2 go? Or, um, so this is 2 here, this 2. So I have 2, but I have to divide it by 3 factorial because it's the coefficient of the third term. So this is always, this term I'm always, if you prefer, you can write this as, well, I just did it, so I'm not going to do it. This is this number divided by n factorial. So to go from here to here, I divide by n factorial. n is 3 in this line. To go from here to here, I divide, in fact, let's write 6 as 2 times 3. To go from here to here, I divide by 4 factorial. The 2 and the 3 cancel out, leaving me just the 4. So the next term here is minus a quarter x to the fourth. And the next term, if you go through it, will be a fifth x to the fifth, and so on. And in general, we can see that this is the sum of minus 1 uh, to the n x to the n. This is plus, this is plus, so I guess that has to be plus 1, over, say, n plus 1, from n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, something's wrong here. Let's start at n 1, and then that's better. Now, we did this before. We did this also by integrating the geometric series. So we got exactly the same answer. Right? Did we do this before? Maybe we didn't. OK. So we can calculate that the log is this series, um, an alternating x to the n over n. And now this is, can I do this right? Uh, you mean on the minus one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or plus one. I don't care. Because the sign's off. I always screw that up. Yeah. Okay. So if you just look at the terms, this is n equals zero. This is n equals one and it's positive. So if I did minus one to the n like I wrote, it should be negative. So I just want to change the sign here. Right? Now, we can do this in another way, as I said. I mean, so, you know, one of the nice things about math is you can do things in several ways and get the same answer because they are the same thing. That helps you believe the truth of it. We can also do the fact that 1 over 1 plus x is a geometric series. It's the geometric series with ratio minus x. Is 1 minus x plus x squared minus x cubed plus x plus da, da, da. And if we just take the integral of this, well then this is the log 1 plus x, because if you integrate, I guess I need to write dx here. If we integrate 1 over 1 plus x, we get the log. 
If we integrate this geometric series, what will happen? Well, this is, let me write this slightly differently as minus 1 to the n, x to the n. So if I integrate that, I get a constant plus, so the integral here will raise the power by 1. So the minus 1 to the, yeah. If I have the minus 1 to the n, the x goes up by 1, but I have to divide by the new power. And if I had been consistent here and started at 0, which is what I was trying to do, I would have the same thing. Right here is n equals 0. And this is x to the 1, and so on. So these are the same thing. And this is also my constant plus x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 minus x4 over 4 plus da da da. And my constant here is 0. Because I know that the log of 0, log of 1 is 0. So I can do these in two different ways and get the same answer. Of course, it's not really two different ways, but it's kind of two different ways. Uh, but this series only converges for certain values of x. What values of x does it converge for? Okay, you should know this. How would I find out? Okay, I can do the ratio test. I can also just know it. But let's do the ratio test. So if I do the ratio test, what I need is the ratio of the n plus first term. So I want to do the ratio test on that series. So that means I want to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1 over a n, which is the limit as n goes to infinity the next term will be minus 1 to the n plus 1, x to the n plus 2, over n plus 2, and then I divide by minus 1 to the n, x to the, oops, the x is on the bottom, x to the n plus 1, or n plus 1, which gives me, so the minus 1 cancels the minus 1, leaving me a minus 1, but I'm taking the absolute value so I can just forget about it. Oh, limit. And so the x to the n plus 2 divided by x to the n plus 1 is an x. n plus 1 divided by n plus 2 is just n plus 1 divided by n plus 2. But now I take the limit. As n goes to infinity, this goes to 1, which is the absolute value of x. So this converges for absolute value of x less than 1. When x is 1, so when x is 1, then I have an alternating harmonic series, which diverges. When x is minus 1, the minus 1's cancel out and give me a series which will converge. Wait, wait, what did I say? So at x equals 1, the series becomes minus 1 to the n over n plus 1, which is converging because it's an alternating series with the term going to 0. And when x is minus 1, I have minus 1 to the n times minus 1 to the n plus 1, which is always minus 1. And so I have this, which diverges. So in fact, it's it's for x between 1 and minus 1, 
but one is included. Okay, so this series, this law, makes sense for x all the way up to give me, I can calculate the log of 2 with this series, but I cannot calculate the log of 2.01 with this series. And I can calculate the log of any number between 0 and 2. Yeah? Okay, so I did two different ways. Maybe that was confusing. I should have focused on only one way. One way, we already knew this way from last week. Of course, maybe it didn't sink in, but we already knew this way from last week. Last week we did integration. Yeah, we, we started with the geometric series and derived new series from it by integrating, differentiating, plugging in, dancing around, blah, blah, blah. So that's the new way. And that's the old way that we knew. Any function will work by this way, as long as you can take all the derivatives. Both ways work. Just like, so your question is kind of like, when do I use the integral test and when do I use the comparison test? Often, you can use either one. Here, you can derive the series by saying, oh, it's a series I know, let's mess with it. Or, just derive it from the beginning. Okay? I mean, your question is a good question. I'm not saying, what a stupid question. This is a good question. But I want to emphasize, these are two different, almost equivalent methods. Here I took a series I know and messed with it to get a new one. Just like here, to calculate the series for the cosine. I could have done it by taking derivatives of cosine. Or I could just say, hey, this, this is the derivative of the sine. Why do any work? Okay? All right. Um, so let me do one more example where I'm not doing it at zero. It works exactly the same way, but you have to pay a little more attention. So. Um, should I do the log? Let me do, let me do, let's do the series for the tangent near pi over 4. That'll be a mess. Let's do the series for the cosine near pi over 4. So I have to remember what the cosine of pi over 4 is, which is not so hard. So, so let's get the series for cosine of x for x near pi over 4. So I happen to know, I hope, that the cosine of pi over 4 I know this, does anyone in the room know it? Yeah. Yeah. It is root 2 over 2. And I will also need to know that the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. So in order for this series to be useful, I have to know how to calculate the square root of 2. OK, so let's just start going. So the cosine pi over 4, I just wrote it down, but I'll write it down again, is root 2 over 2. So the first term in my series will be root 2 over 2. Now I take the derivative, ah, let me make my chart the same way I did before, I'm sorry. Just make the root chart. So, so here's n, here's my function. If I evaluate it at pi over 4, and then I'll get my term. 
So cosine of the pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And here, that's the first term of the series. So my series is root 2 over 2 plus something. When I take the derivative of the cosine, I get minus the sine. The sine at pi over 4 gives me a minus root 2 over 2. And so then my first series will be this, divided by 1 factorial, which is just 1, times x minus pi over 4 to the 1 power. So my next term, this is f prime pi over 4 times how far away I am from pi over 4. Maybe this was a bad example. It's all right. The next, if I take the next derivative, the derivative of minus the sine is the cosine, which, when I evaluate, once again gives me this annoying root 2 over 2. Uh, but now we have root 2 over 2 divided by 2 factorial. And then we have an x minus. Yeah, there's a negative sign there. Don't you see it? <laughs> and it just goes on in this way. The next term will be minus the sign. Again, I get root 2 over 2. Negative. Yeah. That was a plus. Didn't you see? Um, and so here I get root 2 over 2 times 3 factorial, x minus pi over 4 cubed, etc. So my series in the end, ah, I always get this factor of root 2 over 2. Had I chosen an angle like pi over 3, it would switch between the cosine of pi over 3 and the sine of pi over 3. So I have that the cosine of x is, I can factor out this root 2 over 2, and then I get 1 plus x minus pi over 4 plus no, minus x minus pi over 4 squared divided by 2 minus x minus pi over 4 cubed divided by 3 factorial plus it should go plus minus minus plus plus minus minus Oh, I have a plus. I have a minus here that fell in the hole. Thank you. Four, four factorial minus so it goes plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, da, da, da. So unlike at zero, where the the uh, the well we mean cosine. So unlike at zero, where all of the even terms, the odd terms go away, here the odd terms play in the series. So the odd terms appear. So what what is the use of this? The use of this is if I wanted to approximate the cosine of, say, 46 degrees, then this would be a very good approximation because I just need to know the square root of 2. And then these things are very small numbers that go away fast. Because 46 degrees minus 45 degrees is 1 degree. I convert that 1 degree to radians, and then this converges quickly. So this is a good, this will converge quickly. Whereas this one over there will take a long time to convert because pi over 4, powers of pi over 4, 
don't go to zero quickly when I divide by n cat 4. Not as quickly as tiny number. Now, of course, because of this stupidness here, I just get whatever I wanted to get. So we'll have to do that next time. Uh, let me remind you that there was a paper homework put up over the weekend, as well as a short web assignment.